Welcome to the Aviation Safety Community podcast, presented by the Aviation Safety Community. This podcast follows a series of conversations with your host, Grenville Hudson, and field experts to discuss aviation safety, the latest trends, and industry insights. Hello, this is Grenville Hudson from the Aviation Safety Community, and uh, welcome to another one of our podcasts. Uh, I have with me uh, Aaron Jones, and Aaron's a senior safety consultant with uh, JVAT, which is a safety consultancy group. Um, he's experienced in safety and risk management uh, consultation, and his background is aviation, defence, and rail sectors. Welcome uh, to our podcast, Aaron. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate uh, coming onto the podcast today, and uh, it's great to, you know, be able to give back to the wider community and share our experiences and help people uh, hmm. understand safety from a different perspective. Fantastic. And maybe you could give us a little bit of a background. I mean, I just gave you a very brief introduction, but maybe a bit of a background on on what you've done to date and where you see yourself going. Yeah. So at the moment. Um, where I'm at, I've spent around 15 years uh, in the workforce, 10 years uh, started out in the Air Force and I started out as an aircraft maintenance technician and work, worked on the Classic Hornet up in Newcastle. And through that career, I was able to travel around Australia, travel overseas, and it really uh, gave me a broader perspective for what I wanted to do in the future. I knew I didn't want to do that forever. So I started studying and um, landed uh, into safety consulting. So I've been doing that for the last sort of five years now and really enjoying it. Really, uh, really haven't, I, I don't think I've scratched the surface on what can be achieved in safety, but uh, I've really learned a lot. And that's sort of where I'm at at the moment. I've had the opportunity to consult with rail industries, uh, aviation, and, and defense currently working on a navy related project at the moment and previously i was on a army uh related project under land oh. 400 so yeah you you talk about and and we're very fortunate enough to have you on our um aviation safety community forum and um and you talk there about many of your experiences and, and the and a couple of uh, case studies that uh, you were involved in. But you, you talk about pragmatic safety and, and risk management uh, solutions. What, what does this mean at the end of the day? It's a, it's a good question because, you know, pragmatic can mean something to the, you know, directors, the leaders, or it can be pragmatic to the users or, you know, yeah. or we can squeeze those middle managers to take on more, you know. So yeah. it, really, it really comes down to making things uh work you know and when, when we look at safety you know what is safety safety is an outcome so it's all about getting a safer outcome so if everyone's um you know happy healthy and fit they're coming to work going home you know in the same or better state you know that's mm -hmm. safety so um it's all about understanding what you really want at the end of the day and and sometimes it, you don't need you know a comprehensive safety management system to, to get that to work it's just a matter of getting everyone on the same page you know understanding mm. their role in safety as opposed to <clears throat> you know having the best safety management system um, making something that uh, integrates with the wider organization because you know we could we we could be working with uh, a small company or it could be a, a, a massive organization but where do the cogs sit and which ones need to be changed in and out um, to make it work more, more fluidly. Mm. I think it's, um, it's a fascinating sort of topic, but mm. to, re to really make it pragmatic, you know, there's, you know it, it really comes down to, I think, mastering the basics. So for me, I would always take the approach of um, implementing something around plan, do, check, act, because... Right. Plan Do Check Act inter integrates with the, the wider international standards. So we've got international standard ISO 45001, and then we've got 9001. Hmm. You, you can actually get them, those, the, the quality and the safety standards talking to each other. But we also know that 
the four pillars of the safety management system with aviation also integrates with plan do check act so if you have that sort of simple mindset everything else sort of flows so mm. you know um for me making it pragmatic is having a little bit of structure there to help it um to help it you know move along mm. so in terms of um safety management systems what, what do you think are the core values that you need to have in place that, um to get you know the safety management system functioning properly. When when you say core values, what what do you mean exactly? Um, okay, so uh, I guess this could also relate into safety culture. Um, you know that sort of thing. You know, is is uh, is it to do with uh, just culture? Is it to do with no blame or you know those sort of sort of things i think at the end of the day yeah i think that's a really good question and, and i mean i think this stuff is sort of uh there's answers out there for this kind of uh question um you know we've got some exemplar information out there through hudson um with the the, the different elements of um safety culture you know you've got mm. re a good reporting culture you've got you know information sharing You've got safety leadership. Um, you've got people on the ground who actually implement things. We've got that uh, re good reporting culture. So we've got that data mm. feedback coming back. Um, we've got a learning culture. People are learning and they want to learn. You know, they want to learn more about safety. They want mm. to learn about their um, role in safety for the organization. Uh, I don't want to quote all of those aspects of safety yeah, culture, yeah, but yeah. but um, but I think in essence, uh, I think it always comes back to the leadership. So, I mean, for example, if I went into an organisation, I want to implement the best safety management system. I want to, but the people I'm working with may not care about safety at all, and that's happened in the past. So, um. And, and we're talking about director level people who, you know, they just have other things on their plate that are more, are, are more important. So it's all about understanding that dynamic and going, okay, what's more important to them? How do we feed in what's, what else is important so that it's on their reporting statistics for the week, you know, because uh, I mean, for an example, I worked in a sales based organization. Their, their metrics are all the bottle all comes down to the bottom line, you know, so how did we feed that in? We actually got the reporting statistics from iAuditor and also from, from the claims that were going in. Um, you know, so feeding that in so that it is visible on the mm -hmm. same bottom line spreadsheet that they're looking at, because we're talking a lot of numbers here. Um, mm -hmm. And how does it, how does it, uh, how do we get it to matter to these people that it, it never really mattered before? Why? Because nothing's ever happened. So it's all about that attitude mind, mind shift as well. So, the, you know, there's so many elements to safety culture that I could probably talk all day about it. But um, yes, <laughs> <laughs> but, but when you look at it from the surface or like from a, a, a scenario perspective, it, it's like there are some simple things you can look at, like the attitude, you know, hazardous attitudes, things like that. You know, just because something hasn't happened before doesn't mean something isn't going to happen. And when I was working at that, that company, there were some near misses um, that were, you know, quite could have ended in disaster. Uh, for example, I was sitting on one side of uh, the road across the other side of the road was the other side of the company. And we had someone, a contractor on site who was simply standing on the side of his truck, uh, probably two, at two levels above the ground trying to loosen a harness or something like that. No fall protection whatsoever. And if he fell, you know, who knows what would have happened. Um, another issue that we came across was uh, the decanti decanting of fuel. Uh, these guys, basically the technicians did whatever they could to decant fuel from vehicles before they started working on the, you know, anything to do with the fuel tank. Um, they didn't have the proper equipment to earth the, the vehicles. They didn't have, um, it was just basically open air, you know, 
Wow. And these guys have been doing this for the last sort of, you know, however long the organization's been there. So, yeah. You know, and, and someone like me walks in and goes, you can't do that. These yeah. guys don't listen to me. They don't care about what I have to say because they know better. They've been there longer than I have. So mm. there's all these dynamics that you come across. It's just like, you know, how do you deal with that? You have to be pragmatic, like you said. Yeah. Go in uh, with an educational mindset, you know, how to educate people. Maybe you can bring in other case studies from other organizations in this case there were some classic examples from workshops that have caught fire and people have passed away because of this sort of same mm. issue. So mm. you go, Hey, here's this that's happened not far away, actually in the same area, Hunter Valley. Um, do you want this to happen to you? Surely not. You know, so what, what can we do to mitigate that? So, yeah. And there, there is this thing, isn't it? Like um, you know, people have done something a certain way for oh, who knows how long, and they've got away with it, and they've never had an incident. And um, and I've, I've been in a similar situation yourself where I've come in and I've looked at it and I've gone, hey, you can't do this. Why not? You know, like we, this is the way we do it all the time. And uh, I think that that is a really big, if you can break that, ad- that attitude, you're going to get ahead in terms of, um, uh, well, improving your safety culture for a start, but uh, you get a lot more buy-in from the people and i guess that's what you're talking about isn't it it's buying people buying into what you're saying yeah exactly right buying in and and i think it comes down to you know what matters most to these people um Mm. it it does come down to you know appealing to people you know and you know there's some people that don't care you know Mm. but you, Mm. you know as as a safety person whether you're a consultant or you're an internal manager, you've, you can't just, um, you know, go in with uh, like a, a guns blazing approach. Just it doesn't yeah. work. You know, you have to go yeah. in willing to make friends, willing to compromise and finding, <clears throat> finding a common ground that you can work with. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. And, and sometimes it comes down to just threading the needle with one or two people at a time. And just building that relationship circle of influences that you can work with because sometimes, you know, it just takes a bit of time as well to, to do yeah. that, you know, you've got to build those relationships. So Yeah. It, and again, it's this trust thing, isn't it? It's so important in the whole part of safety management, people having trust in each other, especially in small businesses, I think, where, you know, everyone is so... Uh, easily exposed as to what they've done, what's happened. You know, everyone needs to have a level of trust to make the whole safety equation work. Yeah, definitely. I think trust comes down to it for sure. Mm. It's, uh, I think when you, if you're a worker on the ground and you've got some person that comes out, comes out maybe once a year or once every six months, like, you know, who is this person? You're going to listen mm, to them, or mm. even if it is regards to your safety. I mean, maybe maybe you listen, maybe you don't. You just like, mm. oh, this guy only comes out when something happens. So as mm. long as we keep things quiet, nothing's going to happen. You know, I don't yeah. know. It just yeah. depends. Yeah. One of the things I found quite interesting in your your presentation was this concept of group thought and and handling group thought. Do you, would you like to talk a bit more about that? Yeah, I think uh, it's it's one of those group dynamics. Uh, I think it's around group group think and uh, alignment of attitude. Uh, you know, it, it happens a lot in in many organisations. People yeah. are thinking along the lines of the leader, and it's all about that uh, environment that the leader sets up for the team. So, if everyone's just in agreement and there's no uh, <clears throat> no debate at all, it's it, it could be a warning sign that hmm. maybe group think is happening when you see all the nodding heads and people aren't talking, you know, it's like, okay, <laughs> people don't, uh, people just want to get on with their job and maybe move on and just agree to disagree or just maybe hmm. not, not even care, you know? So sometimes group think can really, really impact the safety of an organization because, hmm. you know, maybe, Maybe it's a budget constraint. Maybe maybe that's a perception that yeah. is 
is apparent. And I mean, what do you do? It's a matter of subtly changing the perspective of that conversation and just saying, Hey, mm. have you, have you thought of this? Have you thought of mm. that? Maybe it's um, in those situations, it's good to ask questions and get people yeah. to think. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's one approach that I'll, I'll do is I'd ask a question around something that I probably think they don't know the answer to. Mm. And, and I'll see if they try to answer it or if they, you know, tell the truth and say, Oh, that's a good question. Maybe we should look into that. You know, so it really depends. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, especially in big corporations, we, you can tend, you tend to get uh, like people in like departments, if, if that makes sense. Like I, I remember I, was, I worked in one corporation and they used to do a lot of that Myers-Briggs um, evaluation and they, they used to say, oh, you know, this person has to be a, you know, this person in this department has to have this profile and as as you say all you end up with is a whole group of people who all really agree with each other because they've got exactly the same profile so i think um that can be a challenge in itself don't you it can be and, and i guess if you're a middle manager or something uh you, you kind of you know there's an element to leadership that is what they call followership so you do have to be a good follower but part of that, part of being a good follower is looking out for the big picture, you know, looking for things that can impact the organization long term, right? So if you've got a strategic mindset and everyone's on the same, same play, uh, playing sort of plane of uh, train of thought, mm -hmm. then, and you're challenging some of those, you know, things, um, that, that's a good thing. So mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're a leader, you should actually look for people that are, you know, perhaps got some ideas, challenging, throwing things out there. Uh, those are the people that if you're watching and you're listening to and you're giving those people the opportunity to talk, that's a good thing. But if you start to notice that those people go quiet, mm. that's even even a, a bit of a more worry, more of a worry because, you know, you've sort of, you may have stifled that person to the point where they don't even care anymore. They just, yeah, they've, they've yeah. put out five or six ideas. They've all been rejected. Okay, well, why, why even bother? You know, I'll go mm. somewhere else. I'll go work somewhere else and, you know, put it, put in my perspectives that there yeah. instead, you know. Yeah, and that, I know that's another thing in the corporate world. You know, like a, you get people working for you and, and uh, you know, they, they're throwing these ideas out there, but as you say, if they're not taken up, they get disheartened. And a lot, a lot of people will only throw the idea out once and they won't keep throwing it out. Do you know what I mean? And I think that that's an issue. I don't know if you've come across that, but yeah. And, and they give up so easily and that's another issue in itself, you know? Well, yeah. yeah. I think in that situation in in leadership, it's, it's okay to reject ideas, but you need to help people understand why, mm. you know? So it's like, okay, that's a great idea, but, you know, if it's a, a lower level manager, high level manager who has per perhaps more perspective of the strategic direction, mm. they can help that person understand, hey, that's, that's a great idea to implement that reporting system. Actually, in the background, we've got something else that we're procuring, and maybe you didn't mm. know about that, so we're going to... Um, roll that out over the next six to 12 months, but we haven't actually made the hard decision to, to go with uh, X or Y software. So it's just like, okay, yeah. matter, matter of just, you know, love your enthusiasm, please keep the ideas coming. But at the moment we are actually looking at that too. So. Yeah. 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 Look, you, you talked about um, a call to action and I thought that was really interesting. Um, and perhaps you might like to elaborate on that. Yeah, so in, in the in the presentation, I, I had a few, you know, hidden uh, messages, I guess, there. But uh, the main one was, yeah, a bit of a call to action for the industry. And, and uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm hearing a lot about this uh, skill shortage across the industry, you know. And we hear it, we, we've been hearing it since COVID, you know. It's like, oh, we can't get international people and all this stuff. I'm like, oh, okay, well. What are we doing about it? Because you know we can't just continue on the same 
path without actually helping the industry grow. So, you know, I, I think uh, when I think back to my career in aviation maintenance, it, it was a pretty stepped out apprenticeship, you know. And as we were mentioning in our offline chat, you can't read a book about swimming and jump into a pool. You have to have someone mm. show you how to swim, you know. So mm. it, it comes down to, uh, yes, we can go to TAFE, we can go to uni. Maybe there's some good people there that, that are willing to learn and grow. Um, but who's actually taking them under their wing when they start their career, you know? Mm. Um, I've heard stories about people jumping into, say, construction and safety, and they, they, don't, uh, they don't like it because how, the, how they're treated as outsiders. Mm. That, that's, a, that's a cultural issue in itself. But who's taking these people under their wing and actually helping them understand, hey, part of our job is challenging the status quo. Part of it is a little bit of uh, enforcement and compliance, you know, in the construction industry anyway. Yep. It's not, not so much in aviation and other organisations, but in, in construction, that's what I've heard what it's like. I haven't actually worked in construction. But when we tie it back to, you know, an industry level thing, I, I, I just want to know who's who's doing something about it who's taking someone under their wing right now who who is senior out there that um can put their hand on their heart and say hey you know i've actually taken one or two apprentices apprentices under under my wing and i've taught them the ropes and taught them everything i know everything i know as opposed to employing them uh in their company for example and helping them uh instead of just uh getting them to do a job I'm actually teaching them everything I know about safety from, from experience, you know, um, that's, that's invaluable. And I had that opportunity when I started, uh, you know, I was really lucky when I got out of defense, uh, I knew I wanted to do safety, but I didn't, uh, didn't really have a pathway. You know, I didn't have, I didn't have much of an idea of where I was going to land. Uh, it was just a, by a stroke of luck, I had, an, had a relationship with my uni lecturer who was starting a business at the time. And he uh, let me know that, uh, you know, we resonated quite well. Maybe we'd like to work together in future. I followed up and we caught up for a coffee. I got to know what they were doing. I, I expressed an interest and, you know, I was lucky enough to work with him for two years. And, mm. and that was like a once in a lifetime opportunity. So mm how many people out there are getting opportunities like that uh, mm. is the question because, you know, if I don't, if you don't learn in a safe environment, you know, maybe, maybe you might think, Oh, I started this new job in safety, but you know, it's not what I thought it would be, you know, maybe, maybe some people are going through that and, and like, you know, we don't want them to, but I think it comes down to more supporting our younger generation and helping them, uh, grow through safety because safety is a it's a different uh, it's a different profession we we mm -hmm. kind of we're not salespeople but in 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 a way we do have to sell our approach to safety and help people we have to educate people we have to mentor people mm -hmm. uh, at different levels of an organization and i come across it all the time everyone you know everyone is an expert when it comes to safety because they've seen something else or, you know, for an example, mm -hmm. in a previous organization, I was trying to implement a, a culture where people could think for themselves. You know, people mm -hmm. could do things. They could, they could uh, action things if they saw them. But the, the kind of statement I kept coming across was, well, actually, Kathy used to do this for us. Kathy. Uh, which was my predecessor so I had to kind of get around that because you know people think in a certain way because they've seen it so mm. you know that, that's a challenge that people are going to come across it's like okay how do I implement something that's going to work as opposed to jump into that group think sort of mentality where oh, mm. I'll just do the things that the way they've always been done, done. that's not safety like you can't mm. implement you can't implement safety like that. Safety is, safety is, in essence, it's like a contingency planning sort of role. Mm. You know, you're setting the organization up so that they can react 
and respond and proactively implement sort of risk management. So you can't mm. you can't have someone that's going to just jump into a culture where it's just like you know day by day just turning up. Yeah. Like, yep. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah, I, I, the other thing that I thought was really interesting in your, your presentation was you talked about that that uh, you should try to well you, should, you need to identify what actually drives you to do safety at the end of the day. And I was just thinking uh, um, of a person I know who worked in a, a large organisation in a in a you know flying role, and they could see that there were problems that were systemic and. And that actually drove them into, you know, pursuing safety as a profession um, because they, they could see that, you know, in big corporations and in general, you know, systemic issues were the things that were causing the, the biggest problems and that, and, that, and that drove them. So, yeah, it's interesting that you said that. I'd like to know more about that if I could. Do you, do you mean like uh, systemic sort of issues? Across. Yeah, yeah, okay. systemic issues, and that he could see that within the within the organisation he was in, and then that sort of got him interest in in safety, and that's really the you know the thing the link that put him into the safety management world. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think some of the systemic issues that I've seen, uh, it, it all. I mean. In a way, it ties ties a lot to uh, you know that um, practical drift of an organisation. Yeah. Yep. You know they've uh, essentially they've gone outside the wire. You know they've they've taken one step over compliance and nothing's happened for maybe a year, and then they're like, oh, maybe we'd take another step. And you know, over time, it, you're ten steps away from that compliance line. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like you know for for example in aviation maintenance uh it was pretty common to carry around a little cheat cheat sheet you know little yep. little, a little little black book have you as you've probably heard of them um and you know they're they're pretty pretty much an outlawed sort of thing you can, yep. <laughs> don't get caught um but but it was quite common because you know you're jumping from aircraft to aircraft and you're certifying the same sort of flight line maintenance or whatever it is. Um, but it wasn't until someone realized that, hey, our technicians are actually doing uh, what they think is right because they know this stuff. You know, they, they've read the publication 100 times and nothing's changed in 28 years. Mm. What, can, what can we do to help them speed things up? So what they did was they actually implemented a better certification system, you know, and it was called memory-based execution. It was, you know, they did a bit of research into human factors, mm. and what they what they found was they could they could implement this uh, system where technicians could, you know, certify for like say some simple little things like, you know, uh, the blanks have been um, removed or the the I forget what the name the name are the names of those tags are the the mm. removed before flight tags have been removed. Oh, yeah. or, you know. Um, the aircraft's been refueled to X, X amount of pounds or whatever. You know, this kind of stuff, you don't need to check the publication for. But in the past, people had to certify that they read the publication. Right. And, yeah. and so it's just that little tweak that can help people. So uh, I think when it comes to <clears throat> systemic issues, in my, you know, in my humble short amount of experience, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's a, it come, can come down to that practical drift and, you know, just takes a little bit of thinking and a little bit of um, challenging the status quo to really make it make an impact. Yeah, I guess uh, with systemic issues, um, as a, as safety prof professionals, we, we can use things like the things like the Swiss cheese, for example, and you can go back and go, all right, what what's working, what what isn't. Um, for an, for an example. Uh, when we when we found some risks in a larger organization, I don't want to mention organizations, but mm, sure. Basically, when we found uh, some surface level risks, for example, fuel exposure, the the things that the client was were telling us were the issue actually was just the tip of the iceberg. So when we went through the data, 
And unfortunately, the data wasn't perfect. It wasn't telling us everything. So we had to go further and survey people, interview them. Uh, when, we got, when we got to the ground truth of what was happening, it was actually uh, gearbox changes and pylon changes that were the main issue, uh, which were pretty much uh, systemic, you know. And when we looked at some of the issues as to why that was, it was, you could pretty much pin it on practical drift. So they had blanking tools that weren't used. Uh, why? Because they weren't being replaced. They were, they were unserviceable for large periods of time. Right. In this organization, we had quite a turnover because people get rotated. So you get posted into an organization and you do what other people do, you know? So you, you check the publication. Oh, where's that? Where's that blanking tool? Oh, we don't have that anymore. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then there's, there was other um, bits of equipment, like a, a massive trailer, which was used to drain fuel out of certain compartments. That was unserviceable. It's a, it's a $70,000 piece of kit. Unserviceable. Why? Because it's not being used. Why? Hmm. Why it's not being used? Because the seals have gone. Well, that's because no one used it in the past either. So why? We look at, we look at why? Because training wasn't provided. So yeah. people don't know the importance of this stuff. Um, but it's there, for their, it's there for them to use. And it was yeah. in their publications, but people you know, implement these little workarounds to get, to yeah. get the job done. And it all comes back to culture. You know? yeah. Yeah. It comes back to culture and... In this sort of scenario, it's just a matter of, you know, it's kind of like a, a litmus test, you know? It's like, mm. are we doing what we say we do, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's so true, yeah. Uh, look, um, I think we've probably uh, taken up a lot of your time. And, look, I really appreciate you coming on our podcast and I certainly appreciate um, you being involved in our Aviation Safety Community Forum. And if anyone wants to listen to what Erin said in that, um, it's available on the Aviation Safety Community website. So please, um, please take the time and visit our website. And uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy what Erin uh, had to say in his presentation. So look, Erin, thank you so much and uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Uh, I look forward to fielding any questions. If anyone has any questions, please reach out to me via LinkedIn. It's just Aaron. If you search Aaron Jones, currently working at JVAT. So if, uh, yeah, if you see me, just uh, ask a question, hit me up. Um, and yeah, I'm just happy to give back to the, the um, industry that's given me so much. So thank you, Grenville. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Aviation Safety Community Podcast. Please don't forget to visit our website, www.aviationsafetycommunity.com.au. We'll see you in the next episode.